Today we want to talk about relying on reference standards. Ref of course, there are you know the four basic types of specifying, and reference standards are one of them. And uh, as we, this diagram is an attempt to try to show how the standalone documents that are published by other people, uh, the specifier draws on them and says, "Oh yeah, what I need is this." Uh, the supplier then reads the specs and say, oh yeah, I can, I can match that reference standard. And the, the contractor can then uh, have some assurance that they are in fact providing uh, what is, is desired. And so it's a, it's a shortcut, it's a means of specifying sometimes some very complex things. Uh, it makes it a lot easier for us. For example, if we had to the uh, specification for Portland cement in the ASTM, the C-150, runs, what, I don't know, six, seven, eight pages of very fine print. And theoretically, about two-thirds of that you'd have to put in your specs if we didn't have ASTM to write those specs for us. And then we can just say, comply with ASTM C-150. But there are some issues with doing something like that, as David will explain. Oh, thanks for that, Lee. <laughs> <laughs> OK. Well, specifications uh, generally include or can include a references article. And you, we're going to find this in part one under uh, part one general. And what has been done in the past is the references article is a list of references that are applicable to the subject that we're going to specify. And there have been a number of different ways to try to do this. And the one that Lewis has up there now is something that has been common in the past, where you'll have the lead-in paragraph to specifying this list as simply comply with the applicable portions of all of these standards and then just include the list oftentimes just by the standards organization name. I, I've, so actually seen, see, I've actually seen a page and a half of all the various uh, ASTM standards that someone thought might or might not someday help them get out, get out of a situation. Yeah, and the point is that if you're using reference standards, they really only apply to the extent that you actually reference them. You know, just putting them into a list or just putting the reference uh, organizations names like ASTM and NFPA, just putting those organization names into a list does not in include their references because there's no specific reference that's being made. Exactly. So, and 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 for that reason, I know a lot of people uh, do that because they um, they think that someday they're going to have a claim and that that's going to somehow get them out of a situation. And um, uh, that um, that uh, well, I. Uh, that's not that. that's a uh, naive hope that uh, just says it's, hey you got to do your homework and you got to figure out which of those reference standards really apply to your specific project not just this product but your specific project and and cite those right because if if you do end up in a battle over it and later you go back in search of trying to find that one reference standard that's going to help you uh, rest assured that the attorneys on the other side are going to be searching for half a dozen standards that are going to hurt you because you haven't made a specific reference and it's going to be an uphill battle and and, and also that just if you're in front of a jury in particular, they're going to realize that it's not at all feasible for the contractor to read, you know, hundreds of pages of uh, dense technical text and then for them, for the contractor, to have to sort out what's applicable and what ain't. That's really not fair, not cricket. Yeah. So what, what I find in my own practice 
the list of reference standards is something that I don't do. I, I don't include it for a number of reasons. And one of the, the biggest reasons from, from my point of view is it takes a tremendous amount of time to actually coordinate that list with the standards that are actually included in the specification. Because if you list a standard, you probably ought to include that, or if you use a standard in the section, you ought to include that standard in the list. And if you don't include it, it ought not to be included. So it's really one of those very last things that should be done when editing a specification. But once you do that check and you have that list coordinated, heaven forbid that you should actually have to modify the section and then try to remember to go back and re-coordinate that list. It's one of those things that's very easily left uncoordinated, which could then lead to some discrepancy in how it's actually applied. The only time I've ever used this is um, for the uh, clients like the GSA <coughs> and the Navy who like a lot of paper and like a lot of formal stuff. And, uh, you know, the specs intact program that is used for some military and other government projects, um, you basically are committed to doing this. But in all the years that I've been specifying, since about 1976 or so, I have never had a contractor call up and say, hey, what is ASTM E84? What is that? What's the right name of it? I can't find it. Okay. But hey, Lewis, I like the, the section format reference that you put in here. You dragged that right out of the practice guide. Didn't I copy you? that word for word, right out of so uh, section I format. Oh, out of section format. Okay, yeah. so this is this is really uh, great advice, you know, that I I think, and it's really uh, summarizing, I guess, what you and I are trying to get to. That just by including the list doesn't make uh, compliance with the standard mandatory. We have that's, a that's really what is key. We have a couple of comments that have come in. Uh, Kevin O'Bear. Well, I hope you can read them because I can't see them on my version of this. <laughs> you're looking, yeah, your smartphone probably doesn't have a big enough display yet. Oh, that's uh, it. Uh, Kevin O'Bear writes, uh, which edition of a reference standard applies? I don't think the AI, a document A201 addresses this object, but the EJCDC C-700 provides a provision stating that the date of the bid opening, or if no bid, the date that the parties signed the agreement is the date on which the current effective edition of a reference standard applies, unless otherwise indicated in the contract documents. And I think you're right, Kevin. Uh, generally, uh, there is a references section in Division One, and I use a very short, abbreviated version of that, but I do put something in there that says that one, uh, the um, areas of the code may cite standards that are not current. And so the first thing is that they need to comply with the version of the uh, reference standard that is cited in the code. And if it's not cited in the code, then it is the date as of the notice to proceed or <laughs> the execution of the contract or whatever, something like that. On the other hand, I've talked to a couple of construction lawyers who have said that they've never had a case that revo that or that was a significant issue. Uh, and, Leo Rosco, I, yes, go ahead, David. Oh, I was just going to <laughs> add on that, Lewis. I usually set the date, if it's not a date set by code, I set the date as the date of the documents rather than the date of bid opening or the date of notice to proceed or signing the contract because there can be some significant delay. Uh, that makes sense. Preparing the documents and the actually going out for bid. That's an ex excellent point, David. That, that I think I'll go back in and make sure that that's what I'm doing. That makes a lot of sense. Uh, Lee Orozco says, if you don't use the summary of references, do you list the full ASTM number and name in the body? Uh, I don't. 
And what I do again is I've got a little statement in that uh, section 01, is it 4200, for references that says, hey, if you don't understand uh, the acronym that's used, give me a call and I'll tell you what it is. And I've, I've been waiting for over 30 years and haven't had a single call. <laughs> Vivian Volts. <laughs> Vivian Volt says, I always include the list in guide specs, but never include it in project specs. Oh, good good idea, Vivian. It's in the guide spec coordinated with care in case the specifier appreciates it and because it subliminally shows off the system's compliance, but I take it out of project specs for the same reason you guys do. Yeah, I, um, and actually in our guide specs, I do carry the list because it's a convenient way to know uh, whether or not the standard may apply at all. Uh, so there is some validity in that. Yes, I think for having that. Maybe on, on to a good example. And, yes. and Lewis, I wanted to back up to something you said about specs intact because there the, the list for the reference standards is actually generated automatically. Uh, and heaven forbid oh, that's right. the coding wrong or fouled <laughs> up in that standard and, and then it delivers all of the error messages for you, but uh, Specs and Tech takes care of all of that for you, so there's really not all that much effort except to make sure that you're editing correctly. Um, Clifford Marvin, your, uh, our mutual good pal, is now living, residing in New York City again, says effective dates are very important, especially when working with the School Construction Authority in New York City. They revise their specifications cyclically and may require current compliance with current standards even when they are revised after the issue date. Hmm. So that, okay. that's an interesting uh, contractual problem that probably wouldn't stand up in court. But again, most of these reference standards, the changes are so minor and evolutionary in nature that uh, like I say, I've never had anybody, I've never run across an issue relating to having the right date on the on the reference standard. And the lawyers that I've talked to, none of them seem to think that's a big issue. Uh, Steve Groth says, or asks, with the hundreds or thousands of standards that are out there and potentially referenced, how do you manage to know what they include? It's not feasible to obtain copies of every standard and keep them current, especially for smaller firms. And, and we're going to be talking about that, Steve, so we'll go on a little further. Uh, Sheldon Wolf says, it seems reasonable to expect those who work with a specific item to be familiar with the related standards. That's easy for you to say, Sheldon. Uh, <laughs> Stephanie says... Well, that I've, was his whole point last month. <laughs> I know. <laughs> Stephanie... His balloon. ...says, uh, I wouldn't do it to anybody other than a close friend. <laughs> Stephanie says, I've come across certain products that are referencing ref reference standards that have been withdrawn. Is it a common practice to still list withdrawn reference standards? Well, I would say it's a common practice, but it's not a good practice. <laughs> Well, you know, that's an interesting question. But it is, yes. And I'm glad you're going to answer it. Yeah, realistically, you can cite anything that you like as a reference standard. Just because it is withdrawn doesn't prevent you from using the standard as long as it's still accessible, as long as folks still can get their hands on a copy to know what it is that you've done. But... You, and perhaps for some good reason. Maybe the standard was changed and reduced a level of quality beyond what you're willing to accept. So from that standpoint, referencing an old standard might be appropriate. The only it's issue just, would be, is it available to the suppliers and the contractors so that they can conform to it? Right. And, and one of the things that I saw just recently, we had a request for a proposal <laughs> from a large Philadelphia university, and I uh, agonized over their request for proposals every time I get it. But they have a list of their own university standards, and 
when you go and look at them, they'll have references to an ASTM, and anybody that's written specs will recognize ASTM A446, you know, the uh, sheet metal standard that was withdrawn in, what, 1994? And they're still referencing this as a current standard. They're also still referencing H.H. H. Robertson, which probably most <laughs> of us know was rolled into Centria, what, back in 96 or so? so I think earlier than yeah. that, but yes. <laughs> uh, but So you have to be aware of what those standards are, but just referencing us, keeping yourself from using um, withdrawn standards is not uh, something that you really have to be overly concerned about if it suits your purpose. Uh, Clifford um, um, adds his two cents. He says there's a, an old spray test standard for testing water penetration on curtain wall that is good to reference despite the fact that it's been superseded. The test is at a higher pressure, uh, higher water pressure than the current standard. And Kevin O'Byrne, uh, forgive me if that's not the correct pronunciation of your name, Kevin. Uh, I would argue, says, I would argue that withdrawn standards conflict with the requirements we discussed a short time ago in this presentation regarding the addition of the standard in effect as of the date of the bid or the date of the agreement is signed. If it's withdrawn, it's not in effect anymore, so it probably could not be enforced. An interesting point. Also, product manufacturers probably don't furnish goods that com comply with outdated standards. Well, I'm not so sure about that. Well, I mean, Kevin has a good has a good point, though. But it's uh, if if you're making blanket statements is about the year of effect on your reference standards. Yes, you better be sure that you're complying with current standards. Well, it doesn't have to. What that statement usually says, though, is that it's whatever the the latest version. You know, just before the uh, whatever date you pick for the effective date. In other words, it might be some three, four years old. I mean, most of the ASTMs are only updated every four or five years. Right. So it's not dated as of the the same year that you're issuing the documents. With all. Uh, uh, and uh, Kevin then points out to require complaint, compliance with an outdated standard. Uh, just specify the addition you uh, require compliance with. And <coughs> tells me that his name is pronounced O'Burn. Uh -huh. Okay, good. Now we'll know. Okay. Hidden choices. So. Well. So with every reference standard, you need to be careful of what things you need to specify with the standard to make sure that you're getting exactly what you want. Uh, their glass is probably one of the best examples because they're within the ASTM C1036 for their float glass. We've got types, classes, grades, and if we and quality levels, so if we're not specifying all of those different options, we may not be getting exactly what it is that we want. Just specifying annealed glass by the ASTM number may not be sufficient. And that that goes through an awful lot of the reference standards that we're using. With we do have to make additional choices and make and specify those choices to be able to get the products that they want. Uh, and sometimes I can, the, the specifier or, or the, whether it's a manufacturer or a product, project spec or a product spec, you can often tell how dated some of the information really is by the kinds of things that they're actually including with those choices. And one that I still see today is this ASTM C90 that some years ago was specified with type 1 and type 2 for moisture controlled and non-moisture controlled. And I, those types no longer exist. They haven't existed for years. So you can get some ideas to how old the specification may be by how the reference standards are actually used. Tommy 
Smith, the, the, the voice from Memphis, uh, says that um, points out that many reference standards have defaults, and so you need to know what the default choice is. And Clifford, of course, points out that of course you can uh, reference, you can modify a reference standard just because it lists a certain, for example, um, uh, tolerance or whatever, that's not to say that you can't exceed uh, the requirements in a typical uh, standard. Right, and many, if ASTM is really, for me, is a classic example because I sat on some of the ASTM committees, uh, especially uh, EO6, the Building Economics Committee, uh, dealing with uh, uniformat, and it's it's amazing to me that what you have to realize is that these standards are written uh, as a consensus document. So oftentimes it's a, the least common denominator. So it truly is an industry accepted minimum, and if you need something more than the minimum, you better be prepared to specify it. Well, let's talk about that a little bit. That uh, we've talked about ASTM, and of course, ASTM is a uh, is an independent, uh, not-for-profit organization. And although um, representatives of various companies may be on the committees, the, many of the committees also have uh, design professionals and other persons who don't have a vested economic interest in the actual product that may be specified by the ASTM standard. But there are other industry standards out there where they are basically put together by uh, manufacturing associations, so uh, groups of manufacturers who send their people together and say, OK, well, what are we going to do about whatever it is, single ply roofing, whatever and come up with some things. And it's not to, I don't mean to denigrate their efforts, because uh, a lot of times, uh, for example, the Single Ply Roofing Institute has come up with some uh, great tests uh, that uh, really do have had a significant improvement in um, reducing losses on roofs from wind damage. But, on the other hand, some of those groups sit around and say, well, I can meet this standard, and the other guy, that guy says, well, I'm not quite there. Let's lower it to this. And, and so, as David says, uh, sometimes those requirements are the lowest common denominator, what everybody can, can do, uh, especially with the industry association groups. And so that may not be quite good enough for your project or the level of quality that you desire. And so you may need to uh, specify something that is higher than the minimum that is in the, uh, in the reference standard. Right. And the one aspect of uh, these standards writing organizations and again, I, I'm speaking from experience with ASTM. The, the manufacturers type, the product standards, I think are pretty well vetted as an industry accepted uh, consensus standard. I think some of the other kinds of standards that are written that are more practice oriented or procedure oriented, uh, I have seen some of those ASTM standards develop, and to my surprise that some of them are actually the reflection of a single person's opinion. So you really need to be careful on how you apply some of these standards and understand uh, what they may or may not mean and how they may or may not affect your pro the end result of your projects. So just keep it in mind that these are not necessarily uh, worldwide or even US-wide standards uh, that have support of a wide base in all and cases. While, and while we're talking about minimum requirements, we might also think that, you know, just because uh, Master Spec or Spec Text or uh, eSpecs, uh, um, BSD Spec Link lists a given 
uh, reference standard for a product does not necessarily mean that you have to list that reference standard. That there are things that, given the context of the project or the context of your client, you know, if you're working for a design build firm and the, the contractor's the boss rather than, than the uh, actual eventual owner and user of the facility, you may not want to control everything. And whenever we're, I'm specifying something, I always want to ask myself, what's really important to me or to the owner? What's really, really important? And if it's not important, even though there's a, a something there that I could specify, I'll I'll delete it. I'll skip it. Yep. You need you need to pick and choose, and that's why if you go back to how reference standards are actually used in the specification, you should be citing a reference standard for a specific purpose. And and you then that the portion of the standard that governs that particular purpose applies, and not necessarily the entire standard. Ah, conflicting standards. What do we do when we specify two things and and one of them contradicts the other? I didn't think that condition existed. Aren't these all <laughs> harmonized? <laughs> Yes, there's this master secret organization that goes through them all and, and does that. Well, you probably can talk better about the building code in NFPA 101, Lewis. Why don't you <laughs> take that one? No, actually, I, I'm actually having to learn that. For many years, I got to ignore building code issues, but I'm having to bone up on that recently. But um, there are things, well, there are differences between, for example, the IBC and the NFP 101. Now, we don't normally regard those as reference standards, but if they both apply to the project, uh, you have to look at both of them and figure out which is the more restrictive. Similarly, if there are more than one uh, reference standard that applies to a given product or procedure, you may need to look through those and make sure that <clears throat> uh, do they both do you really need both standards uh, and if so if are there contradictions that are going to result in an RFI I hate RFIs they come right out of our our uh, profit margin um, one of the things that I've run into is um, uh, it's not real common but some of the standards may actually conflict with the conditions of the contract and specify AE responsibilities. For example, the AISC so-called Code of Standard Practice has some hair-raising requirements in there about turning around shop drawings. Uh, that's really spooky. By the way, you can download that free. Now, I haven't looked at it in a couple or three years. Uh, but I doubt that they've changed it. It's based on, it's written by contract or subcontractors for subcontractors. <laughs> and you may want to be leery of that. And so I have got my um, structural engineers to have a little paragraph in their specs that says uh, that the only accept to only reference certain paragraphs out of that that document, and I have a in my uh, Division One section on reference standards. I specifically state that if there's something in the standard that conflicts with other contract documents prepared by the architect or the owner, uh, that it does not apply. Uh, I don't. I don't have the number for the AISC. Uh, someone asked about that. It's but it's called the um, Code of Standard Practice. And uh, like I say, that is and a free. I wasn't aware that that one had any conflicts in it. But oh yeah, that's for pointing that one out. That's a that's a spooky one. Um, well, because what I, that would what I, that means is. If you get into it, I was claims manager for a while for my previous firm. 
if you get into a claim, delay claims, delay damage claims are usually worse, bigger than personal injury suits. So they're serious business. If you, so if you've got a contractor that is making a delay damage claim that relates to the turning around of submittals and says, well, you specified that you're going to, you know, to prepare the submittals according to the AISC code of standard practice. If you're doing that and that testimony comes out in front of a jury of lay people, when they hear the word code, they're going to think that has the force of law. And they're going to say, oh, well, you should comply with the code. Everybody knows buildings should comply with the code. So that one in particular, just even from the name, is a, is a little scary. Well, I think you hit on the key there, Lewis, because there are a number of standards out there that are titled with the word code in the standard name. And mm -hmm. those are the ones that tend to have administrative requirements in the standard that are meant for local jurisdiction adoption as a code. And if we're simply using them as a reference standard, those administrative requirements can be problematic. Yeah. But under the AISC code, theoretically, if you have a 100-story building and you get a set of uh, steel shop drawings, you've got to turn them around in two weeks, two weeks flat. That's Maybe a thousand. To me. <laughs> um, Kim Chiat Kirkpatrick says, conflicting standards. I happened to me once. I did the research before. I knew they conflicted, and the engineer did not even know it. Uh, he tells me what he actually wants. I document it and email it to everybody in the meeting and affected parties. Okay. okay. I think we're ready to go on to our next. Okay. What happens when we get to the CA phase? Yeah, I want to hear you explain that. <laughs> Well, of course, the, the biggest thing with the CA phase is the review of submittals. And um, sometimes uh, the reviewing of submittals gets delegated down to uh, junior people. Uh, a, a, uh, one of my previous firms, not my present firm, I was shocked one day. I was walking through the drafting studio and there was a, a young intern fresh out of school. He'd been on, only been on the job three days, had never worked on the project, and he's just checking shop drawings and submittals. And no one had told him how to do it, and we all know that that's something they do not teach in school. And uh, so uh, I was highly incensed and went right over to the project manager and said, hey, look, you can't do that. And, and they did, in fact, reassign that task to someone more qualified. Mm -hmm. But um, obviously, from that opening diagram that we saw that I, I prepared, um, reference standards are this method of short uh, communication, shortening abbreviated communications between the owner, uh, between the <clears throat> designer, the supplier, the contractor, and as long as we all agree that a given product meets those standards, then we're all happy with it. Okay, so back to what happens at the CA phase when we're doing submittals. If we're relying on these reference standards, then we also have to rely on our CA staff that's reviewing all the submittals to know what's in the standards, don't we? <laughs> Because um, well, yes and no. It going to have to check against those. It depends. See, if if uh, for example we've ex we've stated that a certain product has to have a uh, maximum flame spread of 25 when tested per ASTM E84, and we get the product data in, and it says that it's been tested and it has a a flame, maximum flame, <coughs> flame spread rating of 20, then it's obvious that it uh, conforms and we don't have to read the whole standard to figure that out. Sometimes and it's not that clear. 
It's yeah, I can't think of an example right now. I'm sure you can since you brought it up. Oh no, I didn't have <laughs> one off the top of them. Thanks for that lead in. I appreciate that. But I the the point that we run into and if you wanna move ahead maybe uh, okay. start it in on the next slide, but it's actually the following one, uh, where trying if we shorten the specifications enough, as we heard uh, Sheldon suggest uh, last time, that the CA staff may not actually have enough information to be able to check to make sure the product is actually compliant. And then it becomes a balancing act with how much do you include in the spec and how much do you rely on the reference standard and your CA staff knowledge of the reference standard to know whether or not the product is compliant. And that, be that becomes a little bit tricky. So if we have access to the reference library, if we have the standards handy uh, for a reference, for our own staff's reference, it's an easy task to check. But without those standards available, it might be tedious or it might not even be possible. So, so Lewis, are you maintaining a reference library like this that would give you a chance to check everything back against the standards? Not as complete as I would like. And if there are any, if there are any product reps out in the uh, in the audience, one sure way to get on the architect or the engineer's uh, good list is to provide copies of reference standards that apply to your work whether they're ASTM or ANSI standards or industry standards, you provide a copy, stamp your name on the top, and I guarantee you, you will be remembered when it comes time to select that product. Right. I guarantee you. I think it. you're right. Yep. The, and we tend to subscribe uh, I have, to... I have a product rep that provides me with the UL uh, directories uh, once a year, and I know... I know who uh, who's on my side. <laughs> uh, you may be looking hard to find those in the future. I understand they're going to stop printing them. They're only will only yeah. be available online. Right. Which is of but, course everything's going to be that way. Right, and you know, as a as a company, we will uh, have access to the ASTM standards, the what used to be the four volume set, which is now only available electronically. Uh, that are that include all the standards listed in the building code plus master spec and spec text and spec link, uh, which is actually a pretty good way to get the yes. bulk of the standards that you need to be able to actually do your job as a specifier. Uh, but the other it's, standards, but it's out of the reach of most of the architectural firms in the country because most of the firms in the country are fewer than 10 people and they can't afford it. They really can't. Yeah, it's still, yes, you're right. It's still not an inexpensive uh, library to have, but uh, you have to weigh, I guess, the risk and the cost and make your own decision on that. But, but if you're I in a large, if you're in a large city, many of those standards will be available in your public library. Now, obviously, that takes some time to get over and find them, but it's not like they're totally unavailable, and that is uh, sometimes a free uh, free source. Um, right. I want to back up and get a couple of comments. Uh, Vivian okay. Holtz suggests, do you subscribe to a standard slash code aggregation service slide like MADCAD? Vivian, I've not heard of that. And uh, why don't you raise your hand and get online and tell us a little bit about it in, in the few minutes we have left. And while we're doing that, uh, Mr. Kirk Practic says, in my opinion, the AE specifier must know the standards and codes before referencing them. Waiting for the CA staff may be too late. Um, Excellent point. And um, and of course, uh, uh, Gregory Reed uh, points out about uh, my suggesting that uh, product reps provide copies. Walking a thin line about copies as issuing agencies may see that as copyright infringement. I don't mean to uh, imply that by any means, uh, but many of these agencies will sell you 
standards for a greatly reduced price if you buy them in bulk. And so if you're a product rep and you and there's a standard uh, an ASTM standard instead of paying the full 40 bucks or whatever for it, they may sell you sell them to you for, you know, 10 bucks a piece or less and then you can hand, stamp your name on them and hand them out. And somebody gave me an amen, but I have no idea what for. <laughs> 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 and Lewis, I will tell you that uh, there were there are standards aggregators available. I know IHS is one that does everything electronically, okay. and they've been doing that for years. When I first was introduced to them, everything was on microfilm, and just recently, uh, I have reviewed something that CSI is looking at as a potential member benefit, which is very similar. Um, whether or not they decide to go ahead and do that, I have no idea. That's still in consideration. This is Vivian and I would dig that. Okay. Well tell us about MadCAD, Vivian. Well I haven't subscribed because it is also expensive but it is www.madcad.com and uh, it carries ASHRAE and uh, ASTM and IBC and um, NFPA standards and a bunch of, um, of other packages and uh, in a variety of libraries. Uh, and the the nice thing about it is that you can, um, if you are a large group or a medium-sized group, you can assign, you can uh, have a number of simultaneous users um, that just jumps around. Uh, well, I, well that, I had not heard of that. I'm going to look into it. Thank you very much. I, I think it's... Um, it's probably a really good business decision for a company that is a few people. Uh, it's a question whether it's a good business decision for a company that is one person. <laughs> True. Well, my firm has uh, has uh, some 15 or 16 offices here in the states, so uh, that would might be uh, just what we need. It might be. Um, hey, yeah. Thanks for pointing that out, Vivian. Appreciate that. Uh, Wayne Yancey says that uh, we at Callison in Seattle subscribe to MADCAD for IBC, ADA, LEED, and ASTM. Uh, Ed Dweppen point says states that a one-year subscription to a document on MADCAD costs about the same as a paper copy, but is available wherever you have internet access. And uh, Wade says that his firm subscribes to MADCAD and it has been very useful. And um, this has been a great discussion. Thank you all for participating. And we we'll hope to uh, entertain you next week. Uh, we didn't get to all of our slides, but I think we've got most of it covered in our discussion today. Uh, this is really a lot of fun, and thanks for all the participation.